Hello everyone, today I decided to frame my presentation in Russian because instead of uh, English that we usually uh, apply as a working language for our events, I decided to speak my native language, my mother tongue, because uh, I will be describing my personal events that are very intimate to me. That's why I want to apologize uh, that uh, you might think that I am focused on myself. I want to apologize for that. Uh, I, I need to mention that uh, the backbone of my work as a curator of Garage Archive, as well as uh, the work I was involved uh, previously, uh, is something uh, which is called in English personal passion, which is not a very personal interest. Personal interest means uh, benefiting from it somehow, but it was not the case. Uh, back then, when I started to get keen on contemporary art, uh, we were in Russia, in Moscow, uh, under conditions when uh, the country had only one level of legitimacy, one level of decision-making, only one uh, window uh, for uh, the government and art conversion, and it was called Soviet state. The art which we call contemporary art today, Back then it was called an underground uh, art, unofficial uh, art, non-conformative uh, art, prohibited uh, art, uh, you name it, and uh, being under such specific conditions of a lack of creative freedom, we were not able to register uh, your heritage. There was no institutional framework for that, and uh, that's why uh, we, uh, Ilya Kabakov, framed the vision of a future in 1983, calling one of key articles, uh, not everyone is allowed for the future, is permitted to the future. This was a bold statement uh, which uh, was converted to the title of Kabakov article, even now after decades, is a threatening one for us. So uh, it is a threat for the artist, and as it was uh, described by Kabakov, artist is controlled by a big boss, by, and uh, this fear of being beyond the future, of being excluded from the future, was the driver for those artists and friends who tried to record uh, their uh, current uh, within their uh, personal archives. That's why I started my own archive. And in the end, I became a person who was also described by Ilya Kabakov. That's why in my case, um, uh, so archive development was not so much about my personal interest, but it, it was like a mania, uh, like a psychic state of my mind, as my friends described it to me. And uh, they were curators, they were art critics. At a certain point of time, I uh, became a person who does not throw things away at all. I kept everything. And the, I was obsessed with this idea. Uh, and um, uh, my perception of today uh, was like this is the past that needs to be recorded, kept from uh, uh, being evaporated. And so we needed to somehow freeze our work and uh, as well as work of my friends and the creative uh, process I was witnessing. And the professional uh, baseline that I used, we didn't have public institutions, uh, libraries, 
uh, that can train art scientists and art artists. Uh, back then, we didn't have archives, and it was like a word of a mouth mostly. And Leonid Talichkin was a person. He was a genius character. He was a collector. He worked as a um, was a friend and the co-drunk of the artist, and they were drinking together. And starting from 1980s, he started to develop contemporary art archive. He uh, wanted to merge a museum, library, and the knowledge base uh, all together to accumulate knowledge without the possibility to reach uh, the display space, the exhibition space, or publishing houses. And uh, my communications with Leonid Talichkin empowered me with understanding how would you would deal with the contemporary time as a uh, academia, uh, as a material uh, to be studied. And uh, uh, via my efforts, uh, we aggregated uh, a group of people, we created a resource that we called an archive of contemporary art. Uh, it was located in underground conditions. We didn't have enough funding means to promote it, to enhance it, and uh, just prompt it to work. But in 2012, Museum Garage offered to uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art to move here in the museum premises and um, found and established a scientific business unit that currently exists in Garage Museum. It's been six years already of its history, being within a garage framework. And the first room of archive in Garage Museum, it's even strange to recollect. It was so limited area really not a lot of room and uh, 2012 in September we established a scientific department unit and archive in a museum and in 2015 we acquired the archive of Leonid Talishkin who passed away by then and they were really nervous and anxious about the further fate of his heritage. This is the way the boxes of Talishkin archive looked like when it moved uh, to garage for the first time. These are the walls of the educational center that you visited today. And uh, from these two archives of contemporary art archives that was created in the end of 80s, as well as uh, uh, Talishkin's archive, this was the starting point for us. And currently we work in three different areas. Area one. This is the library that was initially structured and we collected, put it together as a contemporary Russian art library by 2014. Uh, it, uh, it, uh, it has grown bigger, it became a universal library on uh, contemporary international art, on theory of contemporary art critics, gender theory, social theory of institutional critics and uh, this library uh, accumulates everything. It has everything that any young researcher might need, the one who is uh, taking a deep dive in the contemporary art, writing PhD, dissertation or any other scientific paper. In 2014 this library has become public, was open to the public and uh, it's been three years already uh, in, on a regular basis. Uh, we host public workshops, leading groups, uh, seminars. We discuss relevant matters, including feminism, Marxism uh, versus contemporary art, etc. The second area, it's not less important, 
even though uh, it's more um, uh, kind of confidential. This is a documentary collection where we keep all sorts of documents related to uh, life of the Russian artists, not just of Moscow and St. Petersburg, but all across Russia. This is kind of dossier. Uh, Russian periodicals, not just uh, art-related, but uh, uh, standard uh, periodical issues, very rare documents that exist as one counterpart, uh, exchange of mails between the artists, self-publishing, small uh, art items, objects, we keep there as well, and a significant number of institutional archives from Moscow galleries is included there. Some of the galleries shut down, uh, other ones they are still operational, but we keep unique documents depicting the economics, if you will, of the contemporary art in Russia. In 2015, we established an institutional archive where we accumulate all the information related to our museum, starting from 2008 up to date. And uh, across all these business areas, we run a work heavy, maybe not very visible, but uh, we do input a lot of efforts to put the materials in system to categorize them. And materials are so versatile and fragmented. We have so-called ephemeric posters, invitation posters, tickets, small booklets, and flyers as well, and we have these kind of unique materials that commented by a curator in quotes, but then we didn't have such a tomb in place as a curator, but in fact this person was a curator edited the catalog of one exhibition that was run in somebody's apartment, uh, the notebooks uh, of collectors and artists, of course, uh, they are of a personal nature, and we cannot disclose this information due to these personal reasons, but at the same time, uh, they uh, still can uh, lay a foundation for historical events, uh, the events in the Russian art history. And these are the drawings of the artists, periodicals, photographs, the food business area, uh, I mean videos, and uh, we put it in a digital format, that video recording of our art life in Moscow and St. Petersburg, all kinds of information carriers, and uh, to conclude with, I would like to mention, we never wanted that our archive to become a petrified uh, entity, we wanted to be a living organism. That's why we wanted to uh, wake up this archive to bring it back to life. It needs to be fully operational and working. We provided an archive background for exhibitions in other institutions like Ekaterina Foundation, for instance. And this exhibition uh, was compiled by 50% of garage archive materials we issued uh, to volumes reconstruction and uh, another project of ours performance in Russia dated as 2014 and we published a book on uh, this exhibition and enormous research project that we run this is a tree of contemporary Russian art this is interdisciplinary project that we run jointly with sociologists and art scientists this is an attempt to present names and creative destinies uh, is not like singularity that are put together in one collection, but as one social network where everybody is interrelated with everybody else by friendship, uh, uh, apprenticeship, uh, relationships. This is the graph depicting this social network, and uh, so we have 
lots of comments behind and um, uh, we can uh, display these comments at uh, interrelations in media installation that was opened in 2014 in four seasons of the year these are 25 phenomena events from the Russian art history as media installation you can see videos you can play them that were recorded and devoted to uh, historical event plus the text describing in we have a photo gallery where we put thousands of photographs uh, uh, like bulldozer bulldozer exhibition kinetic movement uh, in the 60s and contemporary art activism and uh, we are trying not just to collect but to display to show it to uh, everybody else to readers to spectators and the ones who were part of the tour in archive perhaps uh, you've seen these books already if you want you can get them and one of the most recent projects uh, the open system uh, project we try to put to systematize uh, the experience of the art organizations in Russia over the course of 15 years we put together 80 dossiers for such ephemeric self-organizations as uh, apartment galleries, street festivals, etc. And um, one of the most important projects, the pivotal project that we work all together as a team on, this is the uh, uh, Russian Art Archive Networks project. This project was proposed by our partner who possess uh, possesses uh, significant uh, Russian art collections. I mean the Institute of Eastern Europe in Bremen University, the archive collection. I'm happy to welcome our guests from Bremen. And uh, then similarly museum on the Vargas University and Northern Dodge collection. Uh, so the guests are here with us as well and the partners from the similarly museum. Very warm welcome to you and I hope that jointly we as three big institutions can create the online resource so we can provide access to this unique information to researchers from uh, different parts of the globe and uh, the ones so, uh, who so far getting information from Russia as myths and legends and now they will be able to get something more tangible and justified so I have nothing else to say on how my personal passion was converted into the institution format and the institution gives an opportunity enables archive to thrive and evolve. This is a living organism and our cooperation with different curators and archive experts in Russia is a proof to it. Thank you very much for your attention. We actually have a, Anna has a quick video that she wants to show because she didn't have the chance to show it in her few minutes. So if we can maybe see that, I don't know if we have time for the whole five minutes, but maybe we can see like some of it and then yes. you can explain. Yes, okay. This video is about uh, the running, the current project that we are uh, running. Sasha, microphone. Okay, maybe. This project is about, uh, this video is about the project that we are <coughs> carrying out in the archives there. <laughs> you see that everybody is using uh, protection because we live in a tropical country and we don't have air conditioning there. So the archive is very... Oh, I'm sorry. The, we are missing the subtitles in English. Okay, I can translate it to you. This is a little bit of the history of the biennial, in the photo that you've seen before, you saw before. Okay. 
Araci Amaral is a, a very important curator and critic, art critic in Brazil, and she used to work for the biennials there. And she's uh, telling us about the, the connection with the art and the biennials and the Van de Zweve herself. Uh, herself. She worked uh, helping the artists to take the, the work from the boxes. Maybe if it's in Portuguese, there's not so much point in... Or is, is there a part to kind of fast forward it to, to see? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry about that. So they she put the wrong link <laughs> on the presentation because we do have the, the subtitles. I can send you the link, the okay. right link. Again. Maybe we should just go to the, to the conversation if you can't hear it, and then unless there's one part that you want to... This is the material that we are trying to preserve from the dossiers. This is Ivo Mesquita, and uh, he, he was the coordinator for the archives for more than four years just when the, the, the dead archive started to be uh, catalogued. It was his mission to bring that documentation out of that dark room. Maybe we should go to the Q&A or to the yes, conversation? Yes, of course. So I'm going to, um, we, can, we can leave, I'm going to, uh, ask a few questions, pull a few things together whilst you gather your thoughts and uh, come up with your questions. So I'm giving you a five minute warning and I'm gonna turn it over to you. So one of the things that I think is um, interesting is that we've been talking about dead archives. You know, at one stage it was actually stated that the Van der Svevo archive, before it was Van der Svevo, it was dead. And um, you start with a comment but that not everybody will be taken into the future, that Kabakov brings up. So, i.e., some of us might die and some of us might not. Um, your, your, not your archive, but the Van der Svevo archive, um, I think it's interesting because it's embedded in it is the kind of struggle for the survival of um, a sustained way of presenting international culture mm -hmm. in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Because the archive from start, or the biennial by starting in 1948 or 51, depending on... 51. 51. Um, is basically the longest running way in which international culture has been thought about. And much of the early stage of the archive was collecting documents and um, information from artists from all over the world. Yes. Whereas with Garage Archive, um, it's not so much the story of one kind of institution or one kind of survival, but many. It has this kind of plurality to it. That's true. But not the, the institution didn't exist. It's the struggle for something that was not an institution. Yes, uh, this was the idea of uh, avoiding a power of big boss who decides who will be taken into, <laughs> into the future. Uh, we wanted to keep it uh, anyway. So it belonged to a circle of uh, people, the small world uh, of contemporary Russian art. And then it grew up somehow, almost instantly. And uh, uh, that's uh, how we live, uh, how we get uh, more and more documents from people, from people to people. It works, still works this way. Uh, even institutions are pe personalized in our situation. Uh, so um, our limits are, at that moment, only uh, the nationality of our archive materials. This is about Russia, not international circles. So um, with, with the way that both have been evolving, you were saying that since around 2006, there have been multiple presentations, or the archive, if you like, these, these so-called dead or petrified um, documents um, become live. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm interested if maybe both of you could comment because there's a, there's a question. There's, this kind of liveness is about interpretation. Each person that comes to use the archive presents it in a different way. Um, but also there's a way in which the, um, maybe the original meaning or the original reasons why people kept this material 
is different when it becomes live. So can you talk about your own responses as people who have been in charge of um, maintaining something so that people can make it live? What's your response to the ways that people use your archives? Well, I was not there actually, but I understand that the archive is open for every public. So we struggled to make it accessible for everyone, artists, researchers, and everyone that wants to use it. But we don't know what we have because the history of the biennials are so uh, far behind us. And there was the, that archive, that Van des Vevo archive was a part of the, the, the archive that was not, uh, uh, there was not uh, administrative and uh, institutional documents there. It was only the, the part of the collectors, uh, the collection of uh, artists' works and uh, information and, and documents. Uh, the institutional one that holds the history and the memory of the biennials and the, the foundation itself uh, was only organized a few years later. So uh, since then, uh, we are trying to make it all accessible. Uh, and there's a huge mass of documents uh, kept for years like that, and uh, the work is done is, is being done uh, since uh, we have more than 4,000 boxes of documents, not uh, talking about the, the digital ones, that they're a huge, huge uh, challenge for us. 4,000 boxes is impressive. Yes, 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 and we don't know what they have inside. <laughs> Everybody, I'm very curious. <laughs> we still don't know, but we give access to them. So. Uh, it's, it's hard to, to... You should lock lo users in the room and then yes, ask them what you but found. but we don't. <laughs> we, actually, we, we, we have uh, researchers by appointment all, uh, only, and uh, they usually do the work better than us because they make all the connections with the, all the documents they have. So um, that's why yeah. the, the publications are so important. Yes, and uh, uh, it's exactly the same I wanted to say. And for me, every document uh, in the archive is a reason to narrate. This is a story, actually. Mm -hmm. And when you go through the whole uh, box, number of boxes, you are telling stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, our archivists cannot tell all the stories. Yes. That's why, for instance, this year we launched a, a grant program for international researchers uh, which come to our archive in summer. There are six uh, members uh, this year uh, of that program uh, and they work with um, our documents and write uh, papers after, after that and we will collect these papers and publish them. And for instance, other ki kind of narratives was used in uh, actually Kate Fowles' exhibition towards the source, which was open in winter this year, when uh, she suggested artists to use artifacts from archive and to um, consider these artifacts as a reason to nar narrative. Mm -hmm. And so we had a beautiful exhibition with some uh, stories, uh, said by artists. So that's how we make it alive. You, you, you asked about the artist's work. So Mabi Betoni was the first one that uh, brought the archive outside the walls. And th this was very important work because she knew that the public didn't know the, the archive and she put the archive in the center of the, the exhibition. Uh, and the next year, she tried to work in the archive again, but there was a project, uh, preservation project uh, ongoing, and she couldn't. She was not allowed to, to, to go into the boxes, and she complains, still complains about that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Questions from the floor? 
Hi, thank you for your presentations. And uh, I will have a question to Sasha. So also it relates to the excursion that we had uh, this morning in the archives. And I was actually thinking that it's really amazing that you're building a garage, not as a museum. Uh, and instead of uh, having objects, you're having this archive, which in a sense, as you say, it's more inclusive or more democratic. But I'm just wondering about the future of this archive when at one point, I don't know, in, um, maybe because of the constraints of like space or resources, you would have to make some kind of selections or some kind of decisions in terms of like what you take and what you don't take. And I wonder what's your idea about that for, for the future kind of? <clears throat> She's actually going to take over the whole of Moscow with her archive. <laughs> Uh, I still uh, um, see some perspectives <laughs> in my lifetime <laughs> in terms of space and um, amount of documents we can uh, accumulate in, in garage. <laughs> uh, but of course, yes, you're right, we're thinking about spa physical space too the, and uh, physical uh, possibilities for us to go uh, to any place in Russia to Come, uh, collect what happened in uh, Siberia or Far East. Uh, and sometimes we ask our colleagues to digitize uh, something to, and we keep digitized uh, materials as well. Uh, but in the same time, uh, as I said, it's important for us to keep this in mind every uh, time, two things that our task is not to collect pieces of, uh, you know, things. Uh, mainly, we, we, we collect knowledge. And in the same time, as our chief keeper in Tretikov Gallery said, usually I say to my younger colleagues uh, from my uh, side, and this uh, chief curator, she was an old lady. Uh, she used to, to start working with the uh, newly arrived keepers. Uh, let's suggest that a keeper dies. So uh, we have to keep it in mind that we have to collect something because tomorrow will be too late. So that's what uh, I think is important when we talk about archive. One more question. Uh, so I was thinking uh, through the uh, talks that, uh, as before Kate put, that there was like transmitting of uh, responsibilities to artists uh, going and unplug some archives. And uh, here there was a mention, since we're talking on institutions, and there were the histories of um, Anders Weber's archive when uh, it was connected to a museum, then to a foundation of Binali, and then to a university, and somehow it's done. And Sasha's archive ended up to be in the museum. And so my question on comparison of these, um, on the one hand, this um, understanding that somebody can, I mean, the keeper can die, and on the other hand, that the, there are possibilities with which institutions archive can collaborate. To me, it seems, and, uh, and also because I'm on this side of curators, that exhibition making is an answer in these possibilities. So it's mostly, I mean, to my mind, it's mostly exhibition than even publications because it let the knowledge be activated at the very precise moment. Can you comment on this? What are your perspectives? For example, if you had an ideal model uh, of archive and enough number of uh, keep, keepers and digitizing people, uh, which one activity you choose, whether it's publication or exhibition making, and what do you think of that? Oh, uh, actually, we are working on research project. We believe that they are very important. Uh, the archives should be doing research on itself uh, about the institution and producing new knowledge also, not only showing that the, the, the holdings that we, we, we keep. Uh, the, actually, we had a, a research project about uh, it was uh, to to film some people uh, in, uh, who worked, curators and uh, artists who worked uh, in the biennials and try to make the connections with the documents and maybe try to, f to put that online as a, a tool, uh, 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 an internet tool. Uh, 
uh, I don't know if it's going to be financed, still waiting for the money, but this is the idea. We need to, to, to try to, to construct maybe new, new meanings and new knowledge about it. Um, well, I absolutely agree in all histories and films. Uh, one of the ways of uh, uh, revitalizing uh, petrified documents. Mm -hmm. uh, but it can be an exhibition, it can be a publication. And for instance, our project Family Tree uh, was first um, put to public as a graphic piece of uh, graphic art, let's say, and nobody catched the idea. This was uh, um, probably uh, we need another stage and virtual space to realize the project. It can be realized only in virtual space. Uh, so, but anyway, um, it can be different. May I not select? <laughs> Okay, we'll uh, leave it there. I have a million more questions, but we'll leave it there for now and move on to session three. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you.